la disertación de John Artington. Él va a hablar sobre cómo manejar el estrés y aumentar la productividad animal. John Artington es Ph.D. por la Universidad de Kansas State en el Departamento de Anatomía y hizo su tesis en Fisiología e Inmunología Nutricional. También tiene un masterado por la misma universidad en el Departamento de Ciencia Animal sobre Nutrición y Fisiología. Es bachelor en la Universidad de Purdue en Ciencias Animales. Es director y profesor en el Centro de Investigación y Educación Animal de la Universidad de Florida del 2009 hasta la actualidad. Eh, John, con un fuerte aplauso lo recibí. Thank you, Jose. I want to uh, thank the CEA for inviting uh, Professor Vendermedi and I here to participate in this conference with you. Uh, I'm one of the English speakers, and so I, Erna's been working with me to uh, look through my slides and my presentation, and I hope that uh, the translation and what I want to, to tell you and uh, visit with you about comes through well. Uh, this area of beef cow temperament or beef cow behavior is something that we got interested in at the University of Florida uh, at around 2003, 2004, when we were looking at management systems that would help improve the attainment of puberty in young growing heifers. And the area of Florida that we're at in South Central Florida is very similar to the climate here. About 1,700 millimeters of rainfall a year, uh, a tropical, subtropical production system with warm season perennial forages. And so we commonly use uh, Bos indicus types of breeds or crosses with Bos taurus types of breeds. And as many of you know, there's uh, advantages and disadvantages to that. But one of the disadvantages of the Bos indicus breed is that it generally matures more slowly. And so the attainment of puberty is generally at an older age than our Bos taurus females. And so we were working on methods to uh, hasten the onset of puberty in those heifers. And what we found is that uh, there was quite a bit of a hormone called progesterone, progesterone in the bloodstream in the blood of prepubertal heifers. Now, those of you that uh, know what I'm talking about with puberty, progesterone is a hormone that's produced once the animal attains puberty from an active ovary. And so if the animal has not attained puberty, there should be no progesterone. But what we learned over that time is that the, uh, the adrenal gland that also produces cortisol, which is an important stress hormone, also produces progesterone at small amounts. So we started to find that these animals that were more excitable, and that's a word uh, that I'll get into in a minute, but had more nervous temperament, produced greater amounts of this progesterone. And so that's the reason why we started studying this, to see how temperament and behavior had an impact on the reproductive responses of developing heifers and then we moved on to mature cows in these types of grazing landscapes. So I want to point out uh, Dr. Reynaldo Cook, who was the PhD student that worked with me on these early experiments. He carried that on as a faculty member at Oregon State University, and he's now at uh, Texas A&M University. So as a uh, introduction, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, beef production systems in the United States with the goal of introducing to you uh, Florida, where we come from, and uh, to show you some of the similarities that, that certainly exist between this area of South America and uh, our, our production system in Florida, and then attempt to create a link between the, the importance of beef cow temperament and overall productivity. So that's the importance of that, that uh, part of the introduction. Uh, the next thing I want to do is try to explain to you what temperament is. Now, we struggled with this ourselves for a while. Uh, just because animals have an aggressive temperament doesn't necessarily mean that they are, are stressed. 
And so the word stress and aggressive temperament or excitable temperament are all three things that I'm going to introduce here. But each of them come together in a common, a common response that we call stress. And I'll introduce to you a little bit about stress and how the physiology of stress impacts reproductive performance in beef cows. And then I'm going to show you only two studies that we conducted, but there's several other studies that uh, I presented in the proceedings article, uh, the paper that we wrote that's in your, your document that you could look at and refer back to, but I'll present two of, you, two of them in this, this presentation. So as a, a, an overview in the United States in terms of beef, beef consumption, uh, the consumer spends a lot of money on beef consumption. And in 2015, it was estimated that total U.S. beef consumption was over $100 billion. And that's went up from 74 billion in 2010. So that, that continues to increase. And that's something that uh, is an advantage that at least in the US that, that we feel that we have uh, with our consumer. But we also know that it is a uh, limitation as well because uh, we're fortunate that people want to eat beef. But we feel at least a, a large group of individuals feel that when a, an individual makes a purchasing decision, uh, they want to consume beef, but they might make another meat production decision based on price. And what we found is, is that over time, the, the cost of beef in the United States has went up a lot, particularly here in the last few years. And I'll show you maybe some reasons why and how that relates to this. But it's not that there's been a large increase in beef, consumption, but rather the price that people are paying for the beef that they're consuming in the United States. And so, as a total, the calf crop in the U.S. has declined some. Now, maybe last year and this year it's going up a little bit, but over the last several years it's went down. And the U.S. beef cow herd has also declined over time. And so that's the reason why these prices have went up, because we've had limited numbers of, uh, of animals. And, and trying to find the, the, the appropriate amount or the appropriate number in the U.S. I think has been a struggle, and it's cost, uh, at least caught a lot of individuals off guard over the last few years. And I'll show you that in a couple of these other slides. So here's the trend for the uh, U.S. beef cow inventory. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier with some of the folks from CEA. This is only reproducing cows, reproducing beef cows and pregnant heifers, all right? The number is uh, reached a peak in about the late 70s of over 45 million head in the U.S. But you can see how it's come down quite a bit over that time. And it's only in the last two years that we started to see a slight increase in the total number of beef cows in the U.S. Now, what's that done with the calf crop? If you look at this snapshot here, it only shows you here the, uh, it only shows you here as the, the total calf crop up to 2017. But you can see that starting to increase slightly. And so it was that time that you saw in the slide before, at around 2014, 2015, that we had record prices for wean feeder calves. And that really made a big difference in our industry. When that happened, I think a lot of people recognized that we had room for expansion and we could produce more, more cows and retain more heifers back into the herd. And so we're starting to see the price of those animals go down a little bit. But I, I read quite a bit and I asked some folks some questions about where do they think that that optimal number is. And most people are believing in the US it's right around 30 million beef cows. Now there are some people that think that our export market might drive the, uh, the, the interest or at least the economy for increasing beef cow numbers but over many years, the amount of export, beef export, is almost offset with our amount of beef import. We generally uh, import about 10% of, 
of our total beef consumption, and we export about 13% of our total beef produced. And so those two seem to offset each other quite a bit. But where are all of those females coming from? Where are those cows at? And this was what I wanted to try to get at. This is the top 25 states, uh, uh, ranches, I'm sorry, the top 25 uh, uh, privately owned or, or individual ranches uh, in the United States in terms of number of beef cows. And nine of those 25 ranches reside in Florida. And all of those reside right down here where our research center is at. It is the most dense population of beef cows in all of the United States. From the west coast to the east coast of, of Florida and peninsular Florida down here. So to go from the Gulf of Mexico over to the Atlantic Ocean, it's less than 300 miles. Sure how that converts to kilometers. But uh, it's a short drive, it's an afternoon's drive. And I always tell people that you will pass more beef cows than any place in the United States through there. But what's interesting is that in this subtropical production system, we don't have any feedlots, okay? So the most dense population of beef cows in a subtropical system, very similar to the production system here, all of the calves have to leave the state. There's no, no other alternative for them. There's a very, very small percentage of those total beef cows that stay in Florida to be finished, but it's very small. And it's, it's for a very local niche market. But the large commercial industry transports all of those cattle out of the state. And most of them are going here into western Texas, Oklahoma, southern Kansas to be finished. On this slide here, I wanted you to see what that distance was. It's approximately 2,700 kilometers from where all of these calves are produced to where they end up going to the feedlot. And so when this happens, it happens in one day. So the calves are weaned from the cow and loaded into a truck and transported out of the state all in the same day. And so the amount of stress that that calf undergoes is significant. And the, the, the production outcome that comes from that has a lot to do with how we manage the cow and the calf at the ranch prior to leaving on that day. So other states often will wean their calves and then they'll keep them at the ranch for 45 to 65 days before they're shipped away from the ranch. Okay, do you understand that, what that means? So they're kept there for a number of days. That doesn't happen in Florida. Very seldom. The vast majority are weaned from the cow and immediately put on a truck and immediately sent to the feed yard. And so the things that we can do to help producers uh, improve the likelihood that that calf will be productive and healthy means a lot to the, to the producers that we serve. And so this whole area of stress and temperament, and then the impacts on subsequent performance of the calf is something that we feel is very important and something that we're really uh, starting to put some effort in. Now, before I go to the next slide, I'm sure many of you are wondering, why do you ship the calves right away? Why don't you wait and ship them later after they've had some time? And the reason for that is all economics and weather. So we wean our calves, the majority of those calves, are weaned in July and early August. Nobody else in the United States is weaning calves during that time. So we have a captive market and the value of the calves is generally higher because demand is higher, because no one else is weaning. Almost everybody else weans their calves in the fall and so most of the calves are coming onto the market in late September, October, and early November. But what happens in late July and early August is we're, we're worried about a hurricane any day. So the tropical weather in Florida is a big, big risk. And we try to sell our calves right before the start of the tropical season. And if we keep the calves in Florida, we never know if the next week would bring a tropical storm and cause a disaster with the baby calves being there. So that's the reason why they are transported out of the state. So, 
This whole idea of, of temperament and behavior, it, it really relates to animal well-being. Now that's a word that when I was in graduate school at Kansas State, we never talked about. We never talked about animal well-being or animal behavior. But today, it's a big issue. So I wanted to just mention to you some perceptions that the US consumer has in terms of what they think when they buy beef, all right? And, and I worked at this for a while, and I asked a couple of my friends in this area. Because if you, if you look on the internet or you Google uh, perceptions of beef consumption or perception of, of beef temperament or well-being, you find a lot of uh, far radical groups that I question some of their survey data. But this relates directly to a consumer group that's used quite a bit. And what they, of the people that they interviewed, 53% said that they believe that cattle that are raised in a humane manner are more healthy for you. The consumption of that beef is better for you if the animal is raised in a humane manner. 58% of the uh, shoppers said that they, they would pay more and they're seeking a product that had some indication that the animal was raised humanely. And I think these numbers are very different than uh, what we might have seen 20 years ago and certainly probably even 10 years ago as well. But what I find even more interesting is that 49%, almost half of the people said that they believe that consuming a non-animal protein diet is probably more healthy for you. So that tells me that these perceptions, these ideas that people have are somewhat misled, but in other areas are driving the way that we think about the way that we raise our beef cattle. So bringing these two ideas together, we could see that there was a, a need, there was a reason why we might want to improve the temperament of beef cattle. And that was a production reason, and it was based on economics. But there's also a perception reason that uh, people might want to implement procedures to improve temperament, because it could help the overall well-being of the cattle, and it could help the consumer, consumer perception of the product that they're consuming. So what do I, what's the concepts then for the future? We believe that the US cow herd is declining. The uh, availability of the most expensive part of production is land, and that availability is going down. So there's not going to be more land. The, uh, the demand in terms for export, we have a, a lot of, uh, of competition in the marketplace from other countries, and that demand is probably going to continue to be limited to those countries that are demanding a really high-end uh, choice prime market, and that's South Korea and Japan, our two largest export customers. The efficient production we know is needed, but attention to animal well-being is going to be uh, important in the future, and we, at least we believe that's true. And so some of these considerations to uh, animal well-being and how we, how we raise the product and how we communicate to the consumer on how we raise the product is going to be important. And so Consideration to temperament and acclimating temperament for uh, the overall production of efficient or efficient beef production is going to be important. At least I believe that. Now, I wanted to point out this word acclimation to you because it might be confusing in the uh, interpretation or translation. Acclimation is often used in the beef industry when we think about weather or the environment. So we might want to use breeds that are acclimated to the weather or environment. And certainly that has a role, that plays a role in the stress of the animal. But in this presentation, I'm referring to using procedures to acclimate the cattle to humans, to the production systems that we put them through, like moving them with horses and people, or walking them through the cattle processing facilities, or in the cattle squeeze crush. So all of these procedures, acclimating them to them to help improve temperament and production outcomes. Okay, so I need to uh, identify or at least introduce to you what is stress. Because we've used these words like, like uh, excitable or aggressive or poor temperament. All of these uh, uh, 
definitions are related, as I said earlier, to stress. And stress is simply moving the animal from what they consider or what they feel to be homeostasis, that area where they're most comfortable, and moving them out of that area. So just like yourself, if you were in this room and the air conditioner came off and we started to get hot, we started to get uncomfortable, that would induce stress. That doesn't mean that you're going to get sick, right? A lot of times we think about stress in animals as being a pathogen or an illness that, that leads to sickness. That, that's not that way at all. It could simply mean that in your mind you feel uncomfortable and you've moved out of homeostasis. And now your mind, your brain, and your physiology is, is, is undergoing several different mechanisms to move you back into that homeostasis. All right, so this is the definition of stress. Having an animal in its normal uh, homeostasis environment, moving it out of there, and that's a stress response to get back. And that response involves many different things that will impact reproduction, growth, and immunity. And I'm gonna show you those three things as uh, I introduce these next few slides. So when we think about this stress, where does it come from? Where does the stress come from? So one of the areas is one I just used, it's environmental stress. So those of you that have uh, experiences with uh, Bos Taurus cattle in a tropical, subtropical environment like purebred Herefords or purebred Black Angus, you might see the stress that they have in the hot and the heat and the humidity of this area of the world. Same thing that we have in Florida, okay? You can also have issues related to cold stress. And we've seen that in the United States where we might have Brahmin-influenced cattle or Bos Indicus-influenced cattle moved to more temperate or cold environments. And then it can be an inflammatory distress. You know that just vaccinating animals causes stress. Now we're doing it to improve their immunity, right? We vaccinate to improve immunity, hopefully to improve the health outcome. But just the vaccination procedure causes stress. And so a lot of the things that we do in our research group is normal management systems, normal management that results in stress. I, I might just add that the number one stress that, an, that a calf undergoes, do you know what that is? What's the number one stress? Maybe I shouldn't ask that question because I won't understand if you answer in Spanish, so I shouldn't ask, but I'll answer it. The number one stress is weaning. And we can't get away with that, right? We have to wean our calves. So the largest stress in the beef production system is weaning, and that's something we can't do without. The permanent separation of the calf from its mother is the greatest stress it'll undergo. Castration and dehorning and vaccination, transportation, are all important stressors. One of them in the United States that's a very uh, rigorous stressor is co-mingling. You know what that word means, co-mingling? Where you take calves that are unrelated and have never been together and put them together. And that results in a stress as well. Now some of these stresses can simply be perceived. And that's a, a, a mental stress. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But certainly the separation of the cow and calf is a perception, right? The weather could be good, the nutrition could be good, but just being away from the mother causes a stress response that we can't uh, uh, get away from. So in terms of temperament, the, uh, there's been a lot of work done to show that temperament results in an increase in, in stress hormones. The hormone that I'm going to show you in my slides is cortisol. Cortisol is produced from the adrenal gland in your body, the same as humans, but that's also the gland that I told you that can produce progesterone as well. And so the pathway I want to introduce to you in just one slide, it's kind of a boring topic, but the pathway is very closely related in terms of reproduction and the normal stress response. And we believe that that's why these impacts between the two come together. Now, the difficulty in handling, and so just the, the uh, temperamental cattle, the effect that, that they can have, not just on their selves, but on, on you and your workers, and on your facilities, your, your, your cow pens, and your fences. And so temperamental cattle or excitable cattle 
can have impacts beyond just uh, themselves. And then this poor body weight gain. This is something that's been shown in the literature quite a bit. Uh, along with that, this, this, this early research group from Colorado State University showed that Boss Indicus cattle uh, had lesser quality carcasses than Boss Taurus cattle. Now, we all know that's the case, right? Boss Indicus cattle do not tend to marble as well as Boss Taurus cattle. But what they found is, is that within, within the group of Boss Indicus cattle, those with better temperament had better quality carcasses. Okay, Just using the, the, the procedures that I'm going to show you here, they could identify animals within that group that had average poor carcasses. They could identify that those with better temperament had better quality carcasses. And this was one of the initial findings that got that, that instigated a lot of people talking about this. But we asked the question, knowing this, that other groups were working on, we were not doing this work, but we asked the question, does this stress, is there a link to the attainment of puberty? So that was the, really the first question that we asked when we got into this. Now, there's other things that uh, I wanna just point out along with stress, and I think we need to remember that, it's that breed, animal breed, and stage of production will all impact temperament. And this doesn't surprise you. I wanted you to see this slide. I didn't have it in my earlier set, but I wanted you to see that because as we move into these uh, measurements of temperament, you all need to realize that this is true. So, false indicus cattle are generally going to have a poorer temperament than boss taurus cattle generally will, but that doesn't mean that they can't respond to some of these acclimation procedures. And then stage of production is important. How many of you have had experiences with uh, boss indicus cattle that are really tame and they, they have a good temperament and then when they have their babies, they turn into a whole nother animal, right? So this is something we need to keep in mind when we measure temperament in these animals. So. The next thing I wanted to show you is uh, related to the breeds. And this is just one study that we completed where we looked at Brahmin, Roma sinuana, which is a tropically adapted Bos taurus breed, like uh, Cinepol, and Angus, and all of the crosses. And in every single case, there was significant correlation between stress and performance, except for the purebred Angus. And now we've seen that over and over again. So breed has a real impact on these types of responses. So what else? The next two slides, I wanna try to create a link between temperament, stress, and the reproduction. So these are hormones that are involved in both uh, stress and reproduction. CRH is produced in the brain and, and literature has shown that it will affect GnRH, which is also produced in the brain, and then luteinizing hormone, which is very important for stimulating the growth of follicles on the ovary. So CRH increases during stress, and this hormone impacts both of these important reproductive hormones. And then ACTH and cortisol, both of those are stress hormones, as I introduced earlier, and both are known to impact LH and GnRH. And then here, progesterone. Progesterone from the adrenal gland or the ovary helps to prime this whole axis, and this can also be impacted by stress. And these are the literature that we know is going on now. So this is, I'm only gonna show this one time because I think maybe it's quite boring, but it's important. So this link is called the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And also, you might have heard of the HPG axis, and that's the hypothalamic pituitary and then gonad axis. All of these three links are very closely associated together by these hormones that I just showed you here. And so there's excellent evidence in all mammals, including humans, 
that stress impacts reproduction and immunity. So with that, I want to just move on and start to show you some of the data going into this effort. Now, before I do that, I want to uh, point out this study that I show a lot. And it is the uh, occurrence of cortisol, which is the one stress hormone that most people understand. It's, it's easy to measure in livestock and in humans as well. And this is a study that was done on military men in the Army. And they were getting ready to have their first parachute jump. So two things we know. Number one, they're very healthy. Right? They went through training as a military personnel, and they're young and healthy and, and physically fit, but they're getting ready to jump out of an airplane for the first time in their life. Now, that would be stressful, right, if you've never jumped out of an airplane. And what they found is when they measured the amount of cortisol, it was normal control and pre-jump, and then almost twofold after they jump. But they weren't hurt. They were healthy, they weren't sick, but just the perception and the stress of thinking about it causes this cortisol response. Now, in this study, they look at many other things as a result of that, but they can see depression in performance as a result of this mental response through stress. So, what do we know then? Uh, what can we do to help improve the temperament of, uh, of cattle? And so the one thing that we're interested in, or were interested in, is this idea of acclimation. And the idea is to, to come up with a system, come up with a method to alleviate poor temperament in cattle with the hope, then, that that will result in improved productivity and improved well-being of those animals. There's plenty of data to show that acclimation procedures did help to improve specific measures of fertility or specific measures of reproduction, but there weren't any studies at that time to show whether or not that resulted in an efficient reproductive outcome, like attainment of puberty or attainment of pregnancy. So those were our overreaching goals for this experiment. So how did we do that? So this is an evaluation of temperament. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing you this. We did not come up with this in our group. We just refined it a little bit and maybe added to the knowledge of measuring temperament. All right? So let me explain these to you. There's three ways to measure temperament. One is called a shoot score. This is the crush, the holding crush. And we simply evaluate it as the response of the animal when they are restrained in the shoot. In this case, we do it on a one to four scale. One being that they're very calm. So they go into the chute, they're enclosed, and they just stand there. They would be a one. And then the four is they're very excitable, very angry, very aggressive in the chute. And you, it's a subjective measurement. That's important. It's subjective. It's your, your perception of it from a one to four scale. Now, I'm going to go down here next. This is the pin score. This one we find that works very well, but it's also very dangerous. And the way that's done is one individual stands in a, in a holding pin that might not be any larger than this stage. And when the animal comes out of the crush, they come down the aisle, go into the pin, and the observer stands there and observes how the animal responds to their presence. Now, the animal could run after you, and you'd have to evade it, run up the fence real quick. That would be a number four, very aggressive. Or the animal might just look at you and not pay any attention. And you only stand there for about 10 seconds and then leave. So that's another measure. But it's probably the more dangerous one. This one is an objective measurement. And this is actually measuring the speed, the speed that the animal exits the crush. How fast do they go? And I'll show you that in the next uh, couple slides. So I'm sorry this is in English because I put this in later. But just to uh, bring this up, the data for shoot and pin score are subjective. They're subjective. It's what you visualize them to be. But you should be careful to make sure that they're normally distributed. And I'll show you that in the next slide. 
because there's going to be a lot of variation. You would expect that. But you would expect to have a bell-shaped curve, right? A normal distribution. Exit velocity is objective. So when we measure the exit velocity, we put them into groups. We generally put them into quartiles. The 25% fastest, next 25, next 25, and then the 25% slowest. The fastest get a score of four, because they're going real fast. And then the slower ones that are calm get a score of one. All right? And then you can do many things. And I, I can talk about this more later. But you can uh, combine them, one third, one third, one third, for an overall score for the animals. That's what we generally do. But I wanted you to uh, uh, see that this is a normal distribution. So you should have at least half of your animals here and then tailing off both ways. But realizing that ranch A, B, and C will be different. But on every ranch, you will have animals that are more excitable or animals that are less uh, excitable or temperament uh, measures. So this is the exit velocity, OK? And it's simply the speed that the animal exits the crush. And the way that that's done is by using these light beams. Um, I'm sure that this is used in, 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 here in uh, Paraguay, but I use the example of rodeo competitions. And rodeo competitions will often use this to measure speed. So it starts the clock when the animal breaks the light here, and it ends the clock when it breaks the light there. And it just measures the speed over that short distance of time. That's the objective measurement. The oh. crush score is the other subjective score. So just simply while the animal is held in the crush, the uh, 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 subjective measure of a one to uh, a four scale in terms of temperament. And then the last one is the pen score. And it's on a scale of one to five. Just the evaluation of the person in the pen with the animal, with one being very calm or five being aggressive. Or you could use a one to four scale. We generally, for this one, use a one to five. But I, as I pointed out, the, uh, uh, the pin score is dangerous. And so you want to be careful that if you adopt that one, you watch out for the, the, the person doing it. So let's look at this now. We'll go into these two studies in the next few uh, slides. So this is a study by uh, Ronaldo Cook, who's a co-author on here. And he did this study with Boss Taurus cattle. The work that we did was with Boss Indicus cattle, or Boss Indicus cross. But I wanted you to see this because this is cortisol here on the y-axis, cortisol concentration. And this is an overall temperament score taken from those three measurements. And, 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 and just correlating that with cortisol, you can see that as temperament score goes up, meaning the temperament gets poor, poor temperament results in greater cortisol concentrations in those animals. And this is an important uh, cause and effect here. We want to be able to be sure that the, what we're measuring actually responds to a physiological measurement of stress, which in this case is cortisol. More uh, recently, uh, Dr. Vendermini and I have been working with a group of cows at the research center where we are weaning uh, some of those cows, half of the herd, when they right at the start of the breeding season, okay? So the calves are only 70 days of age, and we're weaning them at the start of the breeding season. We call that early weaning. And just by removing the calf from the cow, that has impacted the ability of the cow to become pregnant. All right? Just the stress of having that weaning event happen, they get pregnant later in the breeding season. So in this line, these cows are weaned, and these are not weaned. And this is the following year when the cows calved the following year. So the ones that weren't weaned, they calved earlier. That means they got pregnant sooner the year before. Just the separation of that calf from the cow, permanent separation, resulted in a stress that impacted reproduction and impacted the attainment of pregnancy. And one other study that Hinaldo Cook completed, he looked at cattle that were identified as aggressive. 
they had a temperament score greater than three or adequate. And he just defined them as adequate temperament at three or below. Cortisol concentrations were greater in the aggressive animals. They had less pregnancy attainment. Because they had less pregnancy attainment, they calved, they had fewer calves born. They had overall fewer calves weaned. And then what's more important is the kilograms of calves that were sold were less than the kilograms of calves sold with those animals identified as adequate because they just weaned fewer calves per cow exposed to the bull. All right, so here's some real life example of the effects of temperament in a normal cow herd on overall cow herd productivity. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to look at developing heifers and to see if we could come up with a system that would improve their overall temperament. So this study was done in, in Boss Indicus Cross Cattle over two consecutive years. The uh, uh, two months uh, after weaning, we instituted these treatments, either control or acclimation. With the acclimated heifers, we, uh, here's a picture of, of those, uh, those heifers. They were all kept in an adjoining pastures. So one group was acclimated, and then this group over here was controlled. The acclimated heifers were walked to the cow pens three times a week for a month, okay? That was the only acclimation. So from this area here, these are the pastures they were kept in, and they were walked all the way to the cow pens and back on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And when they were in the cow pens, they were... When they were in the cow pens, they were lightly restrained in the chute before they were released. All right, that was the acclimation. Now, during that trip here, that's about almost one kilometer. So one kilometer there and one kilometer back. And we did that for one month. Now, what we ended up with then is that because they walked all of that distance, the acclimated heifers gained less body weight. And when we saw that response, we thought, well, this is going to be a real problem because usually body weight gain in young heifers is the number one determinant of attainment of puberty. We want the young heifers to grow, but our acclimation procedure resulted in less body weight gain. But what surprised us then is the attainment of puberty. The acclimated heifers attain puberty sooner than the control heifers. So even though they had less body weight gain, they, they attained puberty sooner if they went through this acclimation procedure. Now, this is the really important outcome, is the association of attainment of pregnancy, probability of pregnancy by temperament score. So for all heifers, as temperament score increased, meaning that they were more aggressive and they had poor temperament, the probability of pregnancy drops dramatically. And that was the results that we saw with those heifers over those two years. It was really, I think, an interesting overall result. Now, why do you think that that's happening? Why? Why is that? Well, let's look here at cortisol. Before acclimation, the, the heifers had the same amount of cortisol. And then 40 days later, after the acclimation procedures, the control heifers had greater cortisol concentrations than the acclimated heifers. And so just this, this human contact and the acclimation procedure resulted in less blood cortisol in those heifers. Now here's what is uh, really interesting, is that the pre-pubertal heifers, they had not attained puberty yet, so there should be no progesterone. But there is a little bit of progesterone. But after acclimation, the control heifers, or the, I'm sorry, the acclimated heifers have less progesterone. Where is this progesterone coming from? Remember what I said earlier? It's, it's coming from the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland is normally thought of as the gland that produces stress hormones. 
And so at, it, the adrenal gland is very active in these females, and it's resulting in greater amounts of progesterone in the prepubertal heifers. We also know that that's true when we look at the prepubertal heifers and just correlate plasma cortisol concentrations, also from the adrenal gland, and, and, and plas plasma progesterone concentrations, likely from the adrenal gland, and you can see it's largely correlated and significant. And so this is why those animals are responding well to the acclimation treatments. And so the overall conclusion from that study is that acclimation of the young prepubertal developing heifer results in improved fertility, hastened onset of puberty, and a greater likelihood of the attainment of pregnancy sooner. So now we ask the question, if this works in heifers, what about cows? Is there something that we can do to improve the temperament of mature cows that would have a, uh, a positive outcome in terms of reproduction? So that was the overall idea. This was also a study ran over two years using uh, both Hereford and Brahmin crossbred and Angus and Brahmin crossbred cows, about 400 total cows. And then what we did in this study is approximately 45 days after weaning, we started to implement these acclimation procedures. Before we did that, we evaluated all of the cows for temperament, and then we divided them up into two groups so that there was no difference in initial temperament score. The initial temperament score was the same for both groups, and then we overlaid our, our uh, uh, treatments. They were uh, maintained in uh, seven different pastures, and then the cows were visited uh, every three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and offered a very small amount of feed, of range cubes. And so the cows started to uh, uh, get used to this interaction with the person, and the amount of range cubes that was provided, or the amount of feed, was uh, about 0.2 kilograms every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so a very small amount that would not uh, impact the overall uh, nutrition of those animals. But you can see by these pictures that the cows became very acclimated. They were, they, they uh, actually, when he would walk into the pasture, the cows would all walk up to him. And so they got used to this procedure. It looked like it was working quite well. So you saw the pictures there of the Brangus cows, and these are our Brayford cows, all undergoing that same procedures. So less than a uh, quarter of a kilogram and uh, the in individual groups. So the cows calved on November, December, and January, and the breeding season began February 1. And so we stopped the acclimation procedure at the start of the breeding season. All right, so we acclimated them all the way from about two months after weaning up to the breeding season. So let's look at those results. Overall, there was no difference in uh, cow uh, uh, body weight change. After calving, all of the cows lost some body weight. Uh, but there was no difference in the amount of body weight loss between acclimated cows and uh, the control cows. This is overall pregnancy rate. So the uh, acclimated cows attained pregnancy at the same rate and total pregnancy as the control cows. So the acclimation procedure had no impact on the attainment of pregnancy. Temperament score began here at the start of acclimation. The uh, uh, temperament scores were not different because remember, we allocated the animals to those two treatments so there would be no differences. But look, after acclimation procedure, still no difference. The cows had the same temperament score after acclimation that they did prior to acclimation. And again, cortisol concentrations, no difference between the two, exactly the same. So, overall, 
it appears that the acclimation procedures for mature cows had no impact on uh, attainment of pregnancy, had no impact on overall cow performance, and no impact on the temperament score. Very different result than what we saw with the uh, prepubertal heifers. Now, what was interesting is, if you take all of the cows, independent of acclimation, just every cow, as cortisol concentrations increase, the likelihood of attaining pregnancy goes down in both year one and year two, with no response to acclimation. But stress still impacted the overall outcome. So acclimation didn't work, but overall stress was still impacting the overall outcome. So another thing that we learned from that is that the impact on the immune response of those cows was interesting. So I showed you the slide before with the HPA axis from the brain to the pituitary to the gonad. Well, here's another example of a similar type of response, but starting with the immune system, and these are implicated, or at least initiated, from stress hormones, like cortisol, and impacting the production of these immune proteins that we call acute phase proteins. And so we measured those in this study as well and found that as those acute phase proteins increase, the likelihood of pregnancy decreases. So again, another link between stress response, immunity, and the attainment of pregnancy. And then one more, last slide on this is the uh, ceruloplasmin concentrations, uh, which is another acute phase protein. As those plasma concentrations go up, the probability of pregnancy goes down in normal, healthy cows that are undergoing a stress response. So in conclusion, these measurements and physiological responses uh, to excitable temperament negatively impacts reproductive performance in beef cows. <clears throat> We've been able to show that Measurement of temperament is directly correlated to concentrations of cortisol in the blood. And cortisol is an important stress hormone, okay? And that if we can utilize procedures that improve the temperament in beef cattle, we can have an overall positive outcome in reproduction in heifers, but not in cows. So it appears that heifers are susceptible to... Uh, uh, changing their temperament early in life. But after they become mature cows, they're much less likely, at least from these data, to respond to acclimation procedures that might improve their overall performance. So it seems like from the data that has been collected after these initial studies that the exact same thing is true in Bos taurus and Bos indicus animals and we could expect similar outcomes probably in production systems all over. So with that, uh, I want to thank you uh, for your time. I want to thank Erna for the work that she's done uh, translating my uh, talk to you. I also uh, invite anybody that's visiting Florida to come and see uh, Dr. Vendermini and I at the University of Florida, look at our production system and see our research system. We would really enjoy uh, hosting you. I also want to really thank uh, CEA for inviting us to come. This is a remarkably well-organized, wonderful uh, turnout at this Congress, and uh, we've been treated very well and really have appreciated the individuals that, that we've met, and I thank you again for your time.